What about showers and how did they build a community? They must all be different. How does this work? So uh, I, I would say, because uh, there is different models. Uh, we have quite a, a few different tiny homes from Seattle down to uh, Olympia, and there is different models, but most of the models, the way that they're set up is, is we have uh, uh, single bathrooms, for instance, like some, like for instance, uh, the E60, it has four bathrooms and each one of them it has a shower inside of it individually as well. Um, and that's how they do the showers and the bathrooms. Mine, I technically work at the six and orchard one. It's a little bit different. Mine's more set up as like a uh, stalls for the bathrooms and then closed off showered areas. So they're a little bit different models because mine is a family shelter. So they have it a little bit different. Um, and so each model is a little bit different for, for the most part. Uh, uh, it is a shower and uh, your bathroom in each uh, separate stall and the amount kind of depends on the, the size of the village itself. Excuse me, Joe, do, uh, uh, do you live in that community? You said you, you mine, are, you keep saying mine. Well, I my apologies, because I take my word very personally. It's When I say my village, is, I work at Six and Orchard, so uh, I'm the project manager of that village. So to me, that, that's my village. I don't personally live in the village, no ma'am. Um, but uh, it is, it is, you know, it is very personal to me. Uh, I, I love my village very much, so, so I guess I speak about it very personally. Andy does a wonderful job, Miss Sharon. <laughs> okay, good. He does. <laughs> good. I have a question. Um, so hello, I'm Rosie. I'm a student. Um, I actually live right next door. Well, like one house next door to the tiny village in Eastside on Wright Avenue. Mm. Um, and uh, I guess my question would be, how do you, who do you guys like, I know there's a lot of people who experience homelessness. Like, how do you pick who lives there? Or is it like a lottery system? So <clears throat> there is a questionnaire that we go through, um, but it so it depends also that that depends on which what um, village that you're at. Like my village, we used to have a, a, a lot of referral services or referrals that we went through and a waiting list. And now we still connect or we still have referral sources, but we also, um, take individuals first come first source. So say there's an individual who's been checking in for like three weeks and we get an opening, we're gonna I'll go with that person just because they were persistent and um, you know, they deserve an opportunity too. Gotcha, thank you. And then I do have another a follow up question. Um, is there any resources that you guys need that maybe the community can help provide? Yes, uh, if you don't mind. So yeah, definitely each village has kind of uh, specific needs uh, because we are in different uh, different communities. Um, you know, I, I, I know for like uh, my village, you know, personally right now that towels is something that, you know, that, that the community could use. Like we have some towels, but we, you know, we always forward think, you know, because the last thing you want to do is be behind, you want to be forward. And so, uh, you know, so yeah, we forward think. So towels is something that, you know, like prominent, predominantly is the one thing that I know right now that you know, that we are definitely going to need in the near future. But uh, as far as uh, uh, Thai and Thai students, they may have different needs. Yeah, um, you know, I appreciate that question. That's a great question. And I know that when we have most of our meetings and we talk to most of the dormants in our village on 60th, and the one that's right next to you, um, we have a, 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 lot, a large number of men. And these men are kind of, some of them are, you know, big men. So, I know one of the things, especially in the wintertime, that I always ask is for, you know, like X3 and X4 type of clothing, um, you know, from size 11 to 14 shoes or boots. And like Joe said, you, we can always use towels. So, you know, those type of things when it, when it comes to the 60th, the McKinley um, tiny village, you know, are, are sometimes hard to find and, you know, any, any uh, resource that can help us out there would be highly appreciated amongst other things. Thank you, Ty. Um, I don't know if you mind sharing your info. I'm actually, I have experienced community like organizing. I used to be a community organizer and I work in nonprofit sector and I would love to get like a clothing drive for you guys or, you know, and get you towels and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we'd love to give you the information. I mean, you know, what do you need? Uh, I mean, what, how do you want to connect? I mean, you know, I can give you my email address, uh, yes. my telephone number. Yeah, either email, I can email you and then 
um, just kind of set one up maybe for the summertime and then come winter, you guys can have coats and. Outstanding. Yep. Um, I can tell you right now, I don't care who here, you know, everyone can reach <laughs> out to me. Um, first of all, uh, my uh, email address is M. Are you, are you prepared to write? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll it in the chat for you. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that too. Uh, well, you can do that, Joe. Yeah. Uh, M A R L O N dot D I L W O R T H at Lehigh dot org. I should just know that email off the top of my head. Come on, man, uh, Joe. <laughs> yeah, and, and we'll definitely appreciate any and everything that you do and um and, and any other any kind of way we can help you out, you reach out to us because that's one of the things that all of uh, the villages, you know, we definitely want to connect with the community, uh, see how we can help out on, you know, on our end. Um, appreciate all the help that you all can give us and, you know, move forward and um, working together to, you know, help strengthen this community, these communities. So I definitely appreciate you. Thank you, so, Rosie. Oh, yes. I, I think this is a perfect time to bring up. We also have a CAC meeting in which we are looking to expand with uh, more individuals in that community right there. Um, so definitely reach out because it might be something that you know you might want to get into. I mean, we just talk about what the, the things are going on in the village, um, how um, we can help the community, how the community can help us and um, yeah, so if that's something you're, if you're interested in, we have that and we have a meeting coming up June 14th, so. Thank you for that. And thanks guys for the work you're doing. Um, I just have to say, it's been a really positive experience. Um, so I really, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, like I wanna say there's some negativity out there. And I really think that that's very invalid. And what people have said about the Chinese villages, um, it's just very like, you know, it's sad because it's it's really, there's, it's a positive experience. There's been no issues or anything. And I think people are just, they don't see the importance of this and we need more of these in our communities. Thank you very much for saying that because I, we feel the exact same way. And once you come to our CAC meeting, which I know you're coming, Bring some of your supportive friends because we need other people. We need more people other than ourselves to say those very words. I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are some of your um, residents working? Do they have jobs? Because I know a, a person can lose their housing so fast, you know. There are working individuals, aren't there? Yeah. Oh, not yes, only do we. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go, ahead, Joe. Not only do we have individuals working, but we also work with uh, organizations to try to help find individuals find work who may not currently be working, like Vallejo, which is a nonprofit. Uh, uh, it's a nonprofit uh, a staffing agency, right? So they specifically work to try to find individuals, especially some individuals who may have a large gap in work history. Um, and so, you know, we're just trying to get them into, uh, and it usually starts, you know, very, uh, very vague few days a week, right? Just to kind of get something. And I think one of the biggest things is to get somebody to where they can put something on a resume. You know, uh, the biggest thing when you have a, a three or four year gap of work and not that all, uh, not that all the residents uh, have that, but just that some of, you know, some of the individuals who might have that barrier is to have something to say that this is what I'm currently doing. And when you put, you put that on a resume, lots of times they'll ask you, they'll say, why are you applying for this job? Right. So there's, they can say, I'm applying for this job because I'm trying to get full time. I'm applying for this job because I need more stable work. Right. It says I'm a worker who's looking for better work, right? As opposed to just, I'm just looking for work at all. So just having that little bit, two, three days a week that really speaks volumes on your resume saying that I'm doing something, I just want to do more. And, and you know, I think that's huge to really trying to get the ball rolling to a, a more stable and permanent job. Yeah. We are also connected with WorkSource. So if any of the individuals would like to get, um, whether it's their GED, um, CDL, or any other type of certificate, or even go for associates. Uh, they, fund those, they fund their schooling with the programs they have, like BFIT and others. And so we use the, 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 
the resources that are in the community uh, while they are engaged in the tiny home so that they do have something when they do leave so that when they do leave, they stay in stable housing. And also Ms. Sharon, um, here with Lehigh, we do even offer them positions with the company, you know, as organizers, which are um, people who pretty much uh, maintain the properties, uh, regulate uh, um, some of the uh, codes of conducts and things of that nature, you know. So um, we, we, do, we, we do our best to offer wraparound services. So we don't just like bring them in and just sit them down. We offer life skills um, programs. Um, we work with them with our own experiences as being, you know, just living, a, you know, living life and learning life. So when our when our clients, well, when our villagers come in, um, they get way more than what one who's, you know, not within that gate would assume. So we offer wraparound services. That's why when we when we do, Todd mentioned you know, the intake process, you know, when we assess them, we assess them wholly, you know, um, in reference to what are the barriers that you have in from getting, you know, we start at the bottom, you know, uh, what are the barriers that's causing you to have this experience of homelessness? And we try to overcome those barriers. What are the barriers that causes you not to be employed? For instance, some may not have their social security card or, or a driver's license or identification. We help with that. Um, we assist with um, doing taxes and, you know, getting stimulus checks and, you know, um, working with some CPS issues, you know. So we offer wraparound services. We go above and beyond um, to help these people, like I said, not only get housed, but sustain this housing. Um, uh, we help them with um, battling those demons. I call them leeches. You know, most of those leeches get on them in the middle of the night and we try to be there early in the morning we got organizers that's with them late at night. So, hey, we right here. So just just so you know, uh, Ms. Sharon, we offer wraparound services. And we never we go to work and never know what we're going to be into that day. But we got a, a certain uh, uh, a certain set of skills and we got a certain tool bag that we can pull pretty much anything out of to make it happen for them. You wear a lot of hats. Yes. Oh, please believe I do. Oh, yes, Thank you <laughs> for noticing. Thank you very much. I like that. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> How do people, are they, is there any kind of communal food service yes. or something? Yes. So we do have, uh, we have a meal every day that comes from, so for, uh, I can only speak for basically uh, south of Seattle, right? So south of Seattle, we have uh, three, uh, four villages, yeah. No, three villages right now. We have three. And so a uh, Union Gospel Mission at the time, uh, they bring us our uh, our dinner every day. Uh, but beyond that, we also work with, uh, uh, we have an amazing gentleman, uh, Ronnie Roberts, who brings us uh, food from uh, Salvation Army on a weekly basis, um, you know, and then we do work with other donors who bring in, in, in food. And so we have a pretty decently stocked uh, kitchen pretty much all the time. Uh, so, and also the individuals are uh, usually, uh, 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 able to get SNAP or something to that effect. So we do provide community fridges, community freezers. So they do have the ability to have food there at the same time. So between the provided meal um, and the donations and working with the Salvation Army and individuals having the opportunity to put uh, food into the their, their fridge and freezer, purchase from their SNAP and so on, they're really, they're really well taken care of. People, uh, a lot of individuals come in and gain weight pretty quick. You know, we get chubby around right here, but we're doing all right. We healthy, all right, we're doing okay. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So, for, so food is never, that's, that would be probably one of the least things you'll ever hear when someone says, what are your needs? That's the one you hear the least, right? But except for, you're going to get this one though, coffee, creamer, and sugar. You'll probably hear those a lot, right? Because that's, that's a huge one. Everyone drinking coffee, cream, and sugar. We can't get enough of that stuff, right? There's something like to that effect. But yeah, you're not going to hear a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of needs for food because, uh, you know, we have amazing staff, you know, that really reach out and stay connected with individuals who really want to help with that need. So uh, that's how, we you know, I don't even the structure of the house. Does it have electricity? Does that yes, where they have a, they have the little fridge in their little in their place? Yes, ma'am. That's great. So that's great. Can you have not a every unit on the property? I'm sorry. 
Can you have a garden on the property? Like a vegetable Joe does. Joe, Joe does. does. So at my yeah. village, we had some, uh, uh, each village was kind of put together, you know, differently with different dynamics and different amazing things. Uh, I was fortunate that one of the amazing things that our village got was some, uh, some uh, pl flower beds. Um, so we do have some, uh, we have some really good cabbage, lettuce, tomatoes, um, some chives. Like I didn't grow nothing. I'm just going to keep it real right now because I'll do that. Um, but uh, yeah, they got peas growing up on these little like teepee stick things. Like I don't really know like all the dynamics of it. But yeah, there's, yeah, they really have good garden going on. And that's the villagers. Uh, we, the hot team, which is the homeless outreach team, one of the referral sources that I work with, they did bring some seeds and so on to really put it in there. But it's the villagers themselves that maintain the garden. And it looks amazing. I mean, they really do. They work together. It truly is a community in a community. It's amazing. Oh, it really that's is. great. And Miss, and Miss, um, Miss Sharon, this is what I'm going to do for you today. I'm going to invite you at your earliest convenience to come and just take a tour. Come and see the work that we're doing or the work that God have us doing, I'm gonna say it like that. And, you know, and just, you know, we, we, we invite the community to come and see what they're supporting at all times. And we also, we invite you to come to that CAC meeting, you know, so you I'll can- I'll bring coffee. Going. Thank you. Yes, now you, now you gotta come. <laughs> okay, now your address, Marlon, and when? Well, um, we're at, uh, 623 East 60th Street. And um is that Tacoma and, or what? Oh, I'm sorry, Tacoma. Good. Yeah, and um are you located in the east side area, the north side area? Um Lincoln District. Doesn't matter. I have a okay. Car. Okay, okay, yeah. And and the time is like, you know, me and Ty, we usually there between eight and four you know so just come you know you would have to see our you know the uh our organizer greet you at the door if one of us won't and you know we just show you around you know you can matter of fact we can maybe break bread and you know have a lunch or something you know whatever you like but we'll definitely have some of that coffee when you come <laughs> well thank you very much marlon and i'll take you up on that offer i'll and see we you appreciate next appreciate you looking forward to meeting you okay marlon Yes, ma'am. My mom called me that. <laughs> it's a great name. Thank you very, very much. Does your, your, does your community have a, did you name your community? Or the... So technically the names of the community was kind of between the organization and the city. So like uh, in Olympia and in Seattle, right, they're called the tiny right that's the referral like the way that they they speak of it they're villages but they call them tiny homes but uh tacoma kind of wanted to uh make uh, uh they they want to call it tims which stands for tacoma emergency micro shelters um and uh that was kind of how they wanted to uh, address the villages in that sense but uh because you know the lehigh's mm -hmm. been around for a long time doing this a lot of people refer to it as the tiny homes and you hear it it's it's a, it's a village you know, and I think that came from like, you know, stems from like it takes a village, you know, and so I'm thinking that's where the stigmatism came. Yeah. Is there a need for um, like donated raised garden beds or anything like that? Would that be something that, you know, he has the garden with his community? Ty, we can use a couple, huh? Well, in the in the plans, the original plans, we had garden beds, and I do know we have some flowers, and they're well taken care of. Um, I do know that we'd have a lot of the villagers that would be very interested in doing it, some gardening. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that would be a go. Okay, I'll contact um, both of you to uh, to discuss that further. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. We're gonna be you having some growing contests. Yeah, we're trying to get, yeah, Joe, we have, we have like a pumpkin contest. pumpkin contest, who gets the bigger pumpkin, okay. Yeah, man. All right. <laughs> just so you know, I've had a garden many a time, so we might just outdo you, Joe. And, and you're looking at, you're looking at uh, Geneva Spears' grandson, who really loved helping his grandmother out in her rose garden when I was five, six years old, you know what I'm saying? So we're ready for you, Joe. Thank you very much, Maria. We need all the help you can, because Joe, uh, he got a high standard there. 
<laughs> I don't plant nothing, so it ain't me. It's amazing. It's amazing villager. Gotta be honest with you. In all of our other guests, you know, you don't have to be nervous, you know, think, you know, come at us, you know, ask some questions, you know, we, we really appreciate being here. Um, Y'all making us, um, you know, think of a lot. So ask those questions that you have. Oh, hi, this is Leah. I don't actually have a question, but I do have something I'd like to just say. Um, I, I have a son who is a resident at the village on 60th, where, um, well, I guess both ties work. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to just say that as a mom, I can't put into words what it means to know that my son is safe and warm and has a community that he can reach out to that's right there for him. Um, he doesn't tell me everything um, about what it's like there, but I know of some of the um, the resources that he's been given, the, the, like, he got a very nice warm winter coat for work. Um, to know that he has meals available um, and just the support and kindness is something I can't thank you enough for. Um, it is a special, I feel especially grateful to know that Ty, who I met as, when I was a student at Evergreen, and she was too, um, is someone that I, I know. It, is, it just gives me extra comfort knowing someone that I know is there. Um, and I, again, I, there's just no way for me to express how much gratitude I have and how thankful I am and how much appreciative I am. Um, thank you so much. Leah, we got you and we got your son. We're evergreeners and to learn, depart to serve. Yeah, I'm so grateful. Thank you. I'd like to commend you, Leah. I know that's something that was very hard to say and it's, it's more than heartwarming. Um, you are you and the community and mothers like you, fathers like you, family members like you. Um, believe it or not, you all you all are always in our prayers. You keep us motivated, and those kind words, you know, I know personally, I'll never forget them. So we will always, always be there for you and yours. I promise you that. That's that you can write that down. Thank you so much. I was wondering about as well is, um, and it's something Jacqueline and I completely forgot to ask about when we were doing our interviews, um, but what disability access um, and acts and resources for folks with disabilities and um, what that looks like. So you know, I was trying to say I could go. It seems like I got all the hard cases. Um, <laughs> so um, we do have um, ramps. Um, for people who um, wheelchair access, we also have a, um, a bathroom that's for them as well. But um, depending on, we, so right currently we have somebody who has Asperger's um, in which I do a lot of her case management, but I reach out to like Tacid. Everything that we utilize is in our community already. Um, we just build those reports with those other um, providers and try to make it as easy as possible for our villagers to get connected with those services. When we connect them with those services, that's just not the end. We follow up and we stay in contact to make sure that 
they are getting what they're their need because at the end of the day that is our goal some people just look at i guess you'd say us in tacoma we're a little different um some people when they look at that housing ready i guess model it's just making sure that they have social security id and an income well we know that there's a little more to that before doing this i did outreach and i've seen how many times we get an individual into a house that had either mental health or substance abuse or just something and then they were back on the streets and i always told myself man if they just actually dealt with the whole person we would be able not only to help more people, but to um, money. I'm not gonna lie, I really feel that. So um, any, we make sure whatever individual that is in our village, whatever disability, whatever, like I said, whatever their need is, that that need is met. And if the community can't meet that need, then Lehigh will meet that need. We, we always start off with trauma-informed care from the jump. You know, we make sure that whatever the traumatic experience is when they first walk through that gate, you know, we assess and we attack that trauma. First and foremost, have them relaxed so they can open up and let us know what their needs are. We also have medical transportation services that will come you know, and, and take them to a doctor's appointments. Um, we'll Uber them there if, if it's necessary. So um, we always start off with trauma-informed care. And like Ty said, that person-centered therapy is the next step. So once again, we offer wraparound services. And please believe that, you know, we go above and beyond, like I said, with, with the average person who's not familiar with our work. Um, we, we, we don't just get them and put them in the house. We make sure that once they get to that house, they'll be able to know how to pay their bills. They'll be able to know how to make their doctor's appointments. They'll be able to know how to budget. They'll be able to know how to maintain, you know, from living in the woods for 15 years to just throwing them in the house without no type of skills uh, being taught to them. You know, that's, that's a gap, you know, and a month later they'll be back out there. So before we even you know, it's a lot of cases where they ask us, uh, how long can they stay there? Why are they staying there that long and all of this? Um, and that's because we're not gonna set them up for failure. You know, we're not gonna just get them in, just to get them out to get another number in there. When they leave, our objective and hope is that we never see them in that realm again. We, we want them to not only get housed, but to stay housed. We want them to not only, um, you know, stop from that, drugs that they're on while they're there with us. We want them to continue to be able to maintain um, recovery. So we try to leave them with not only financial help, but supportive help at the same time. And they can always call, call us. And like, even if they've been out of the program for a year, you know, our phones and our doors are always open to them. I agree a hundred percent. And I will also say that I was, and I think Ty would agree with me, our hardest and biggest job is to show that we do care. They are somebody and that um, there's no judgment. You can't build all. rapport or change. You can't do anything without, because they've been through the system so much, whether it's been this shelter, then the stability house, you know, and so they, they've been in circles and a lot of them have guards up. They don't. They don't believe that you're really going to help them, and um, they think that you're just judging them. That you know, you're just here for a paycheck. We're not. Nobody in this line of work could, couldn't you know or is, is here for a paycheck. We are here because we care and we want to see a change. And every day, whether or not it, it doesn't matter if we're having the crappiest day at home, we're going to show up. We're going to be a hundred percent and we're going to show them that we care and that we are there fully for them. And that does a lot right there, just building their, their self esteem and their self worth because they've lost a lot of that on the streets. I mean, if you think about it, most of the time, like even, at, you know, little stores, water, 
one of the biggest things, I, it blew my mind. When I was doing outreach, I just, I would think that when we were going out there, like some of the things that you would have thought was like the need was, was irrelevant. Water is such a need because you can't just go into a store and get a cup of water because you're thirsty. You gotta buy something. Or, you know, they're like no loitering. I mean, so they have a lot of stigma and it's, they're attacked in so many different ways. Like you said, trauma informed that first we have to break down those barriers to begin to help. And I can think of a more wonderful feeling than when we support them and then they go and, and, and accomplish something on their own. They come back, you know, they may have came in the office like this, but hey, guess what? I got my ID, I went and got my, and you know what? I got an, uh, an appointment for a job and they bouncing around and hey, Todd, man, I bought a honey bun. You want a honey bun, man? I Look, that, they tend to forget that they have those certain set of skills. So, you know, like Ty said, who are we to judge? We will never judge them. I don't care what situation they come in. And the feeling for me, I know is, man, look at him go now, you know? So that's what I mean by we offer, we go above and beyond. The whole staff go above and beyond when it comes to our family that has experienced homelessness. And like I said, when you see him flourish and then come back to give back, it's a wonderful thing. So. For all of you that's getting into this, you're gonna have a wonderful time. Just put your heart first. You know what I'm saying? Put them first, put your heart first, and you're not gonna have a problem. Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, I have a, a, a unlike a Ty and Ty, I, I began working with Lehigh from a different direction uh, because I was experiencing homelessness I actually lived in the tiny homes in Plum Village uh, a couple years ago. And that's how I began uh, going through it. I have been through the program. So is my mother and my best friend. Uh, I, I went into the program, I got work. I was working for a forklift operating company. I ended up getting a car and then I got into permanent housing. I got my children back. So there was a huge journey from that. And the amazing thing, I think one of the biggest things that's important is that we have 24 seven staff and sometimes people get the, the feeling because we're not security. We're organizers. We're there for them, not because of them. There's 24-7 staff there, but there's not a lock when you leave the fence. There's a lock coming in, which means that you're protected. And this is your place. This is your tiny home. Nobody can come into your community without somebody coming to the gate and letting them in. There's no locks on the way out. This is your place. You know, uh, nobody's allowed into anyone else's unit. That's your unit. That's your place. That's your key. Uh, you know, uh, some of the small things that I think people you know, don't look at it as like, uh, I was looking for work when I was on the streets and I would bring a backpack. I had a choice to make whether I'm going to bring my backpack into my job interview or I'm going to stuff it into a bush before I go to my job interview because I don't want to be seen with the backpack and possibly think that it might get stolen. These are some of the small things that I personally, because I came, I came from the other angle, uh, Ty and Ty were amazing uh, case managers, which I had a different one in uh, the Plum Village, but they have that same discernment, the way that they speak to people. Like I always felt like we were kind of all in the village. And that's why like earlier when Sharon spoke to me and she said, when I said my village, I take it very personal because it is my village, not my original village. My original village was in Plum, but that's why I take it personal. And that's the kind of people that we work with. Like I always felt like we were always there because they worked there and it just seemed like they came out of a tiny home. Their tiny home was an office. I came out of a tiny home, but it was number 14. But uh, even the manager of the, uh, the uh, Plum Village where I originally went, and for, he always said to me the same thing. I have been from living there as a resident to being a part-time worker, to being a full-time worker, to being promoted to a manager and actually running a village in Six and Orchard. He's always said the same thing to me. He said, if you need anything, let me know. Now, this man is still my boss and I've been through four different positions through Lehigh and he's always said the same thing. That's the kind of character that uh, the organization kind of builds within their employees. You know, it's, you speak to them the same. From the day I meet you, I met a person. That is it. I don't, it's not, it has nothing to do with, with uh, you know, what you're wearing, what your income is, nothing to that effect at all it has to do with I've met a person today. And what is this person trying to do with their life? Uh, I don't do the case management side, but uh, I know the case manager side only from the sense because I worked with amazing case managers through Lehigh before I ever worked there. Um, this organization does, they will hire from within. They will, you know, they'll give you that, like, you know, they see you for who you are. 
as a person and what you're trying to do. And they will hire from within. And that's why they have some amazing, uh, uh, you know, uh, employees that, you know, that uh, nobody knows my story. I have a CAC meeting. Nobody knows my story. I don't share it because I want them to know who I am and not who they might've thought who I might be. I'm sharing it with uh, all you individuals here today, but I've never shared it in my CAC meeting. I'm bringing it up because it's important for, I have a different set, a different crowd here. My CAC is specifically drawn to uh, what they may, you know, what they look at in the village, you know, and, and I didn't want to give them a pre-stigmatism of who they might think uh, somebody experiencing homelessness is. Um, so it's different here because I have some amazing individuals that are listening in and I appreciate this to kind of show that this is what Lehigh does. This is what the organization does. And this is how they let people grow uh, beyond just getting you into, into permanent housing. Uh, you know, so there's, there's so many different aspects to this, uh, this organization. That's why it's near and dear to my heart and the people that uh, work here, you know, are amazing. And I've watched them transition so many people's lives. Uh, this is a, it's an amazing company to work for and it's an honor to be a part of it. So y'all are students, um, are y'all going for, like you're all already employed and do you want to tell what you're going for, your major, you're going for a bachelor's degree at Evergreen and do you have um, something specific that you're going for, you know? Does well, anyone actually, want to? Actually, Ms. Sharon, uh, I, I have a social work degree from Pacific Lutheran University. Uh -huh. And also, also got a um, chemical um, um, substance abuse certificate from Clover Park some years back. Um, and I'm currently in a uh, master's program of clinical rehabilitation and mental health therapy. Um, you know, uh, so, and, and even, even after that, I'll be in someone's class. I'll die either going to school or leaving. I promise you that, because in this in this particular field, um, from my experience, and I'm a 50, 51 year old grandpa, there is this this you know, things change at least every year and a half, every two years, and just because you got one particular degree or one particular certificate, you need to keep that enhanced to keep up with what's going on. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll I'll be educating myself in an effort to be more of a um, a better servant to this community and to this population. So I know personally, I'll be taking some sort of certificate program. I'm thinking about my doctoral program. I'll be doing something um, to enhance my knowledge of what's needed for the rest of my life. Well, as for me, I don't necessarily see me going back to school to get a master or any other type of degrees as of right now, but um, I do like a special project that I'm working on that, again, I hope is going to help our community. So I think we all got little things that we're working on that um, is going to better our community in a whole. Yeah, I, I personally, uh, I, I've been going through like a, a peer support, uh, peer support, uh, peer support, um, trainings and recovery coach trainings. My angle that I'm really going for is I just want to have a better way to make sure that the language that I use and how I help individuals try to navigate uh, the how they feel about themselves, because that's a big one when you start trying to get your life together to you don't have a lot of self-worth, um, you know, and you're so worried about what someone else thinks of you as opposed to who you think you could be or who you know you, you know, where you can go. Um, and that's a huge one for me. So I work on just trying to find the language to help motivate and so on. And that's kind of really what I, what I focus on because I find myself uh, staying in this field uh, and indefinitely, you know, and because I, uh, uh, not only because my vision aligns with them, but also because um, I can respond to them. And I, I, I know that there's greatness in it because I've seen so many people come from a very harsh position and, and flourish, you know? And uh, so I, I truly have faith and believe in that. And I wanna make sure that I can kind of critique my words the best to really get, the, to, to let them see that as soon as possible so that we can get them on the journey a lot faster. I had a question. So if finances were not an issue, 
are there aspects of need that may not be fully being met, like something that would be added to the program that you could think of that like gaps that need to be filled, like what was mentioned earlier? Um, and if so, what would that be? Well, I think that, I mean, if, if when you say fine, it's not a problem, it's like, well, if you could build some more uh, low income housing apartment complexes, like, you know, but so I think we're thinking on a thing, uh, cause that's a huge one that, uh, you know, we're in such a scary time where we, with them, just with the moratorium, we have individuals who are just scared to rent to individuals who may seem close to that barrier of just making enough, um, you know, because they, if for some reason they don't pay, right. So they're already kind of scared in that. Um, there's, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, open availability for somebody who is set in a specific income. Um, and so, you know, trying to find the housing, we have individuals who are ready, who are they, they are set in a certain status, like uh, say an older individual who has like SSI, SSDI, that's their income. That income is not going to be adjusting anytime soon. So trying to find housing in that uh, scope is, is a hard thing to do. Uh, and, you know, I know the case managers do an amazing job uh, hitting the pavement constantly, trying to find something within that, that price range for them. Uh, that's just, that's a real huge one. Uh, that I know that, that I constantly hear for, uh, you know, from case management is, is just trying to find the places and the availability of a place and something that, uh, you know, can fit within the, uh, the, the scope of someone's finances, you know, and um, that's, that's the real big, huge one, I think, that I hear a lot. Uh, another, I would say, barrier to that when we say talking about housing, the credit aspect and, you um, the criminal history. Uh, a lot do have somewhat of a criminal history, but when you look at some of the things that are on there, it's more related to like, not excusing, but like identity theft, um, fraud, things of those nature are always connected to something else. Most of those people that are doing those things were doing it to, or, or theft. They're, they're feeding some other type of habit. Um, so, I wish that they would be a little more um, not so judgy on that part uh, because I know that we're they we're supposed to keep it where they have to if they qualify with just the the rental history and the income that they shouldn't look at it but at the end of the day they still do look at that criminal history so um, that's another one credit and criminal history. Yeah, well, both both uh, Joe and Ty said is extremely, uh, you know, some huge gaps. And just so I can have some sort of input, um, I, I would think on the medical side of the game or the mental health side of the game, you know, uh, we mentioned earlier that we try to get them to their appointments. Uh, you know, we have uh, bus passes and uh, there's, you know, transfer services that we can call and things of that nature. But I think um, one thing that could help is if there was you know, some kind of medical service um, that can come by the actual um, camp uh, village itself and just check on them, you know, knock on the door, give, you know, if there's a need uh, or even some of our um, villagers who are experiencing um, some unfortunate mental health um, situation to have some, you know, uh, mental health services to come through and check on them, you know, and, and while they're actually in the comfort of their home and sort of speak, you know, I mean, um, that, that would, that would help out, you know, that would actually lift them up, uh, make them feel special in reference to, um, you know, look what someone's doing for me, you know, and a lot of them, you know, especially the ones that have the walkers and the wheelchairs, you know, um, it's a small challenge for them to get to a lot of places. And I think that would be a great idea if we can have more of that, you know, we do have a couple of organizations that come by every now and then, but if we can have more of, you know, that type of, um, you know, mental health or, or or just health services, period, that would actually come to the camps. So now that you said that, Ty, um, that makes me think down a whole other line, um, housing for those individuals as well, because yes. um, somebody functioning with um, uh, um, Asperger's, we have someone, you know, who is schizophrenic. So um, we have a lot of individuals that do need some 
first of all, affordable housing, but do need some kind of um, support still in that, in that home. And it's hard to get them into like adult family home, especially when they have a lot of, I guess you would say. And so that's uh, one of the problems that we have um, right across um, a lot lately, just, just getting them um, housed and not going to like just a room where they're in a room and yeah, their house, there's no services. So, you know, there's nothing, nobody to, to to look after them, to make sure that, you know, they are good. Um, we need, we, ne we definitely need those services. Well, mental health altogether, we need, we need services, we need housing. Um, we need the community to come together when it comes to them because, you know, um, it's just sad. It really is sad. Um, we have elders that are in our villages, which is another thing that just breaks my heart because when I think of, you know, my grandma or my granddad, you wouldn't think of them being homeless. Um, so we need to have some more services for them where they don't end up on the streets. They should not end up in a tiny house. That should never be the thing. Um, so, I mean, I can go on and on and on about what I think we need, but I think that just starting here and having this conversation is gonna do a lot. Once they find a home and have that job, um, how long will services continue for them? So <laughs> with me and Ty, we're kind of, I don't know, I would say that, you know, we don't let go unless, unless they let go. So we are always, they, we have people that have been out of the village that still call us um, for support because again, it's a transition and a lot of them is new to them. And I mean, just the fact that now I have a home, I, I'm in this home, what do I do now? I mean, they're alone. Normally when they're um, unsheltered, they're in a community where they feel safe. Now it's just them, you know? Um, so anytime, you know, they can come back and, 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 and speak to us. We're gonna be there. If they're like, hey, you know, we don't have no food. It, it doesn't matter what it is. We don't stop. Once they leave the village, doesn't mean we stop caring. So as long as they're, they need us, we're gonna be there. Um, but what, what we notice is when they do, you'll see where they'll start falling off. And that makes me feel happy because when they stop calling on us so much, that means they're figuring it out. And then you see them six months later and they're like, Ty, look what I did now. I got my own car, I got this. And so that extra support, I definitely think is needed. I don't think that we should just push them out the door and then here you go, you know, you figure this out. Because I mean, you gotta think, they're learning new life skills all over again all over again yeah i definitely think i want to touch on that as well because it's true it's when they uh especially someone who's been chronically homeless it's it's that community is kind of it's uncomfortable for them for a long time right just you there's a lot of mistrust you know when when you're experiencing homelessness because of things you may have dealt with when you were saying in like in a mitigation camp or an uncontrolled camp center and uh you know out and so there's a lot of mistrust. And so like when I noticed when a lot of individuals come in, especially chronically homeless individuals, they're very to themselves and it takes a while to get them to open up. Uh, you know, they're very private. Uh, they don't trust. They think that, you know, that there's there's an ulterior motive because it's been a long time since they've had someone who wanted to help them without some kind of background story, ulterior motive to why they want to do it. Um, so once you kind of break that down, then when they get to that position and they get into housing, last thing you want to do is just cut it off. Because that's kind of like this was, you know, this was their beginning. And so then as they transition in, and, and I, I, I too have had a lot of individuals who have moved out, who still come by, who still speak with me. And it does, it, it begins to dwindle, but that's because it's, it's weaning in a sense, you know, for lack of better words. And, you know, we miss them when they no longer contact us, but that means that that's because that's where they're at in their life. But it definitely, uh, you don't want to just no longer have contact with them because it's, even though they've gotten used to that community now, they need to get used to just having that community and them going out and presenting themselves. When you come into Lehigh, we present ourselves to you. 
and find out who you are because that's our job. But when you get into a real community, uh, you know, out there, it's like you have to present yourself. And so yes. you know, it's Rebuilding good to still have these community. friends. Yes, rebuilding their community and what it looks like. Um, yes, I agree with you 100%, Joe. I know in most, in most um, you know, counseling therapeutic sessions in which, you know, we are amateur unnamed counselors at the end of the day. In most of those type of set, uh, settings, you have an ending, um, you know, session when it's about over, right? Um, you know, to let them know, hey, this is our last session and it's good to meet you now. We never have that conversation with them. We never have that, hey man, it's been good. Um, I, I, you know, we'll see you later. It's always, hey, the number's still the same. The door's still open. And like Ty, Ty said, they leave us before we leave them. And, and, and it's a good feeling because that lets us know that, hey, Hadn't heard from such and such in a while. You must be doing all right. So we never leave them, ever. I believe they do come back around. Don't <laughs> look like messenger. And it's good. And and I like that. I like that. Yes. Because, you know, then you know they're all right. You know they're solid. They're good. And um, it's, always, it's always a good feeling. Yep. I think one of the biggest things I find... Uh, uh, that's, that's kind of near and dear to my heart is when you have an individual who has moved out, they've been gone for a while and they stay in contact. And then one day while they're still working and still employed, they ask about open availability positions within the, the organization and they have a good job, but it's something that they want to do. And that says two things to me. It says one, we did our job. It means that you're happy to work at this place because it trains you to do the way you're supposed to be treated. And two, you know how to treat people because you knew how you were treated. I think that's huge. And I think that's why, uh, again, you know, I commend Lehigh for that. They build the some of the best employees by by showing, leading by example. You know, So anytime someone contacts me back to say they're in old positions, that's near and dear to my heart. It was the path I took myself. And so, yeah, I think it's always a great job. That says we did what we were supposed to do. And I've seen a lot. I actually personally have someone that works in my village that came from uh, Ty and Ty's village because you know they do an amazing job and she's an amazing employee. She's great at the job. She's always about picking up the hours. She's amazing, amazing. And that's because you guys, Ty, I just want to throw that to you guys. Thank you very much for that great employee, by the way. And so that's honestly <laughs> a huge, 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 huge plus for me. I don't know if you could do this or not. And of course, not using a name, but could you share a story with us of someone, like where they were when they first came to the village and the transition you saw them going through and how they kind of moved out of the village and into um, stable housing? I, uh, I can share a story because I can, I can give you my personal story, my mother's story, and my best friend's story. Uh, so this is all real life for me. I, uh, I had made some, uh, I had two sons pass away and I made some poor choices and I got deep into alcohol and drugs. And I lost the two kids who I had raised for 13 years by myself. And uh, it was a quick downhill uh, drop. You know, there's no excuse for, you know, for, for any of my decisions, but it's decisions I made. And it got to a point where uh, I needed to change my life, uh, you know, and so uh, I finally got that clarity. And then when I wanted to change my life, it was hard because then it was like, where's the starting point? I'm staying at the mission. They're handing me, you know, uh, you know, sleeping bag and a yoga mat. And, you know, I'm just trying to find, you know, work and there was, you know, barriers there. I didn't have no phone. And, um, so, uh, I went from there to a mitigation tent camp. And then I heard about this tiny homes. Um, it was brought to my attention from someone who was eating at the mission with me on a daily basis. And he kept telling me about it. And I kept calling him. I finally got in. I met a John, gentleman named John Brown who, uh, brought me in and, uh, kind of my background just so how they don't judge. I had been, you know, I've been in jail and I was a trustee at the jail next to this, uh, next to the tiny home village and the, correction officers came out and they were like, hey, Joe, hey, and they're waving to me and I'm trying to get into this tiny home village and I'm afraid that, you know, this guy's not going to let me in now because he's going to judge me. And the boss told me, uh, you know, excuse me, uh, the manager at the time was my boss at the time. He told me, he said, whatever, you know, your past is, he said, that's not what we're concerned about. We're, we're worried about what you're going to take care of, what you're going to do in here. That was it, right? And then I got into the tiny homes and, uh, you know, I had my own place and I, you know, I got to shower on a daily basis. I got clothes, you know, I found work. I got a car. 
Um, I and then, uh, you know, I was working a full time forklift operating job. It was great. And then, um, you know, I tried to get my foot in the door with Lee. I thought it was amazing. Like, these are great people, you know, like they really care. Like, you can't really tell who works there and who lives there because they all just sit there and chat. Like, it was no big deal. I was like, wow, this is a cool place. So I started working the weekends there and I was working seven days a week for four months to, you know, to try to get my foot in the door with the company. Right. And, uh, you know, that's just mine. Uh, I, and I ended up getting my, I ended up getting, uh, uh, permanent housing about six months in and uh you know and then uh i'm getting my kids back um i you know i went from a part-time to a full-time to now i manage uh the six and orchard site um you know it's a 60 percent positive move out rate we've had 14 individuals move into permanent housing since december we've reunited four families we got an amazing thing right and this is not because i'm amazing right it's because i work with an organization that gives me the tools a community that provides and supports the needs and because I know how simple it is to, uh, to put yourself back together when, when you can talk to someone who's been put back together themselves. Um, my mother's went to this program before she passed away. She got permanent housing. Thank you, mom. I just this year and I love her very much. Just wanted to tell her. And, um, you know, but she got in permanent housing before. Uh, so I'll always be near and dear to Lehigh for that. My best friend, she had lost her kid, uh, lost her place to a heroin overdose. She had to start her life over. Um, you know, she, uh, she went to a tiny home. She had to go through a lot of programs and so on to try to get her kids back. Um, and so when she, uh, about four months in, she finally could get her kids back. They got her into a place called uh, Pear Blossom, which is like a transition housing for mothers to try to get their kids back. She now lives in permanent housing, has her son back, and she's doing amazing as well. Um, those are just three stories that are just personal stories. And I know they're real because they're mine, my sister, mine, my best friend, and my mom's. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Joe, man. You a super guy, man. The system works, huh? Organization, yeah. Yes, ma'am. And that's why we want you all who's listening that, you know, wants to support these tiny homes. That's why we would invite all of you to come to our uh, CAC meetings you know, and, and just learn more and give your opinions on why you feel like um, they're necessary in the communities. And, you know, that's why we invite you all. And I, I'm happy this, this, this didn't go anything like I thought it was, you know, I thought it was going to be some kind of uh, school type of thing, but I'm so happy to be here and to be able to say the words and hear the words and to be um, experiencing this with you all, because, you know, these tiny home communities do way more than you can even imagine. And, and it changes lives, not just for the, the villagers, you know. I know personally, I'm reminded every day of, you know, where I need to grow as a human, where I need to grow as a servant, um, how thankful, you know, I should be. And, you know, and, 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 you know, I get up every, you know, I don't miss work. You, you're looking at a, a diabetic that, you know, limping around half the time and, you know, but it's, they, the villagers always say, hey, Todd, man, thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. Man, thank you, because you've done more for me today than you can only imagine. So I want to, I want each and every one of you to, you know, come and, 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 and share your thoughts and share what you believe and, you know, and, su and to support these um, villages because they are doing wonders for our community. For me, I want to thank Evergreen um, because I went there um, and a lot of the people that are now in service work, I graduated with. And the one thing that always is that you guys said, enter to learn to part to serve um and here i'm back and on this platform where now i'm able to show not only my growth but what we're doing in the community and that um every way you know it was a little different but you know, the community is important and i'm glad that i i would i would have never changed anything about evergreen I just felt like I got so much more than just learning. I got to experience what a community really was like and just in that ever it just an evergreen and how much you can do with just a little 
um, garden. I mean, so I just thank Evergreen for letting us be here and again, being able to share, you know, what we're doing in the community. And because um, I already know all you guys are get, that are getting ready to graduate, I promise we're going to see your guys' names and emails. I, all, I see it all the time and I'm like, oh, that's my girl or that's my guy. And, and, and it's nice. So all the professors, um, Dr. Shepard, I mean, even the ones that are gone, Dr. Laners, I mean, you guys really go and give your all to students and um, we go out and we take that and <laughs> we do what we're supposed to do. We serve, so thank you. So when is this next meeting, this CSA or something? CAC? Didn't you say it was on the 14th of next month, Ty? So yes, it's on June 14th. On Monday, I will have the link. And if you are interested in being on the CAC board, um, I will have the paperwork for that as well. Um, I do ask that you do come because we need we need more people that are for this than against this. And there's still more lives that need to be touched. You can complain about the tents and not wanting to see the, the tents and the garbage and the, the, the hurt, the pain, because that's what I look at and want to get rid of it. But then it's our duty, I feel, to give them some place to go. We can't just say, we don't want to look at that, tear that down, and that's just it. Let's give them, a, give them somewhere else to go so we can work on these barriers because we do know that there's a lot of, a lot of barriers, a lot of trauma, but look, give them the place to work on those things because guess what? They are a part of our community and have always been a part of our community and we don't know their story. They could have been, you know, a teacher at one time. I mean, so they're still a part of our community and they have a lot to offer and not just, I'm unsheltered. <laughs> we got to start taking care of our people. I know I would like to say that, you know, in my, in, in, in my endeavors of life, you know, especially in my, you know, the last 30, 30 years of my life, you know, I, I've been learning and trying to implement different theoretical perspectives. And I know I've mentioned earlier that I'm a person-centered, uh, strengths perspective type of guy, right? Now, I just want to leave you all with this. And one of the reasons why I would love for you all to come to the CAC meeting. Um, one of the theorists that I love the most who I try to pattern my life or my services behind is Carl Rogers. In a nutshell, he believed and he had an unconditional positive regard to life, UPR, you know, unconditional positive regard. So for those who are out in our communities that, you know, don't necessarily just want them, hey, get them away from front of my house, get them away from front of my store, like Ty said, move the tents and all from resources. We need strong leaders like you all to come and help us to get them to understand that each and every one of us got to have unconditional positive regard for life, period. So I'd just like to end with, with that. UPR, we need to express more unconditional positive regard to life in general. One of the things that I really appreciate about your communities is that when my husband and I were homeless and we were applying for housing, because we weren't in our kids' lives at that time, we were both stay-at-home parents before we ended up homeless. Individually, in our lives apart, we met while we were homeless and we tried moving forward. To apply for housing when you are single is very challenging. So we were living in tents and trying to move forward. And um, yes, we were using and we weren't wanting to go into a program, 
Um, but we ended up getting housing after I got pregnant on the streets. And um, it's hard. Like he tried to get into housing before I tried to get into housing. And then we tried together, but there just isn't housing available. But now you guys are providing opportunities for single individuals, single men, single women, couples and families. You guys are touching bases on a major need, major needs. So I, I just thank you for that. Well, I just have to throw out there and dogs because we have at least 25. <laughs> so we take the pets too. Right. Yeah, we, we that was one of the questions that we asked. And it was cool to see that, you know, like all of your communities that responded were accepting animals and stuff. Oh, yeah. And, that's, and that's big. It's a companion. We, we, we offer wraparound services for the pets as well. You know, we got food on site. And, you know, if, if we need to link them with the Humane Society to get their shots or they get exams, we take care of their, all of their, with their family as well. So you know, wraparound services for each and every one. Yeah, the Tacoma Pet Food Bank also brings any things from uh, waste bags, leashes, collars, harnesses, um, you know, and even if they have specific diets, like they go all the way to specific diets and it's cool because yeah, yeah. they, they reach out from all the way to our uh, Olympia Village and all three of our Tacoma Villages as well, which is great. What time did you say that meeting's at on the 14th? It's at six, I believe. Yes, it's at six o'clock. And where is it located at? It will be on Zoom. And so um, Monday when I get the link, anybody that is interested, um, Ty already put, or I and Joe put Ty's um, email and I'll put mine. All you have to do is contact us. I will send you the link. And I also will be just doing a follow up um, a couple of days before, just you know to you know because we all get busy to let you know it's going on. And um, again, we would really like you to see you be there and um, help support the, the community and the community's need. Because um, I, I do want to see a lot more um, and get a lot more of these get get a lot more people off the streets. Well, I was just, um, you know, I'm dependent on social security and I'm living off a of Pell Grant. This is, I'm at Evergreen and this is um, the first bachelor's I've ever had. So I have to really prepare for next year and what I'm going to do. And with uh, Tacoma has, um, is the fastest growing city in, in the 10th, fastest growing city in the United States. And that's got to affect the, the and um, the rents are, on a moratorium, maybe for the end of this year, but I just wonder what they're going to happen, you know, in 2022. Just how much they're going to go up, and um, okay, baby. So I'll just have a roof over my head, maybe, you know, nothing else. And I'm just wondering, wow, am I going to be in a tiny home? I could do it, <laughs> but you know, that's coming up for a lot of people because we're in a very volatile community here in Tacoma. So has the moratorium moved back from June 30th? No, is it still, it's still set at June 30th? I'm gonna, it. Okay, yeah, it, it seems like they're probably gonna move it again. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if they moved it again, but uh, I know June 30th was the last date that I had heard. Oh, and then they can raise prices? Well, June 30th just means that the moratorium will be gone. And so if you're not paying rent or something to that effect, they can start to do an exit process for individuals who may who may not have been paying rent or something. Because the moratorium just means that they can't kick you out just for not paying rent or something to that effect or whatever. So it's it's kind of like a stop to, uh, you know, pushing individuals, uh, you know, out of their homes. But June 30th, there's going to be a lot. It's going to be interesting if the moratorium gets pushed back again. It's going to be very interesting. And so when we're talking about the tiny homes now, it's like the tiny homes are a huge need now. Um, but there is going to be a, it's going to be a, it's going to be really awkward because when the moratorium drops, two things are going to happen. One, a lot of people are going to end up needing tiny homes, but then two places are going to open up for some of the individuals in the tiny homes. So it's really going to be, uh, 
you know, because there's not a lot of housing options now. So it's going to be, a, a, you know, it's going to be horrible on one end. And then, you know, uh, and since we can't, we can't, we have no control over that. Hopefully we can try to at least get some of the individuals in the tiny homes into some of these places that are going to be vacated. And then hopefully we can try to draw, you know, and maybe we can kind of recycle it and just get everybody back in, you know, into permanent housing. I guess that's kind of the, the larger scope of the picture, I guess. So, and if there is anybody that is needing rental or utility assistance, I do have a lot of resources to um, prevent um, individuals being out on the streets. I know that the city of Tacoma, you can go on their link. I also know that MDC is doing a lot of work. Um, again, you know, email me, I can give you some resources and um, some things. They're also doing it for utilities um, and, so they're trying to, which I think is great. They're, they are really trying to keep individuals in their home instead of, because we all know, just like you said, it's, it's easier to keep a place than to find a place. true because i'm trying to find a place in tacoma right now if anybody knows i'm looking for a three bedroom i'm just keeping it real like i live in olympia i'm trying to get to tacoma where i work and i'm just saying if anybody knows where a three bedroom is even with the garage <laughs> apartment house it started out there let me know what I'm saying. so i have a question for you jacqueline are yeah. we able to get this recording? Um, yes, I will get the information for all of you and pass on the links, definitely. So it might be on like a website or something for anyone to view who was maybe in different breakout sessions so that or people that weren't able to attend. And then also for anyone who wants to watch it again. So I will get those links to you. So with that being said, um, we wouldn't have to sign any disclosures or anything to um, give it to our company and maybe they um, display it on our website? Um, I would need to ask. Okay. And I will ask, yeah, and I'll let you know about that too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, what is the, um, what is the website? Lehigh.org. www.lehigh.org, yes. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and just putting it out there too, um, we're looking for some case managers as well. So, is that so? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. I need a part time case manager. Six and Orchard is going out there. Shh, don't be trying to take nobody. Look, I, <laughs> talk to me first. I need a more. They got two amazing ones over there. You said <laughs> you definitely need a part time case manager at Six and Orchard. Uh, I will be in touch. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I just have to throw it out there. Anybody you get from Evergreen is going to be awesome. Just saying. All right. And Leah is incredible. She's, yeah, she's wonderful. So. What is that, that, that thing when you're a, you're a product of your environment? <laughs> so, as a product of Evergreen. Uh, I, thank you, Jacqueline. Social learning theory. <laughs> I know we're kind of running um, running down on time. Um, but something I was wondering was what uh, what was the most difficult thing each of you had to um, deal with or adapt to once COVID started in regards to the villages? For me, it was just outreach. Um, I did a lot of outreach, which you know brought in people into the village, but also 
brought in a lot of donors and uh, a lot of the donors, they do like to see, um, they want to see inside. They want to, they want to, you know, see what we're doing. And it was hard to be able to say, hey, you can donate, but for COVID, we can't let you in. Because that's where we get most of our support is by individuals actually seeing what we're doing, um, seeing what our, our, our villagers are doing. I mean, seeing that it, it is a, a positive atmosphere. It's a community setting and that um, that stigma, oh, they're just all, you know, on drugs. I mean, all the, once they're in the village, all those, whatever they're thinking that is negative, most of the time they go out and it's all positive. So I wish we could do more, more of that. Um, it just kills me, but um, hopefully soon. And then the other thing is, um, I used to have a lot of providers come to us, um, like whether it was the uh, um, free cell phone um, to get them connected to medical um, insurance. And so that also um, has been a big thing to me because I do like to use um, the community um, for those wraparound services. And even though we still have those wraparound services, um, it just makes it a little harder um, for them to have easier access. And then when it came to the chemical dependency side, um, I work with a lot of the treatment centers, them not being able to engage in that community as well and having to go through Zoom when you, you know they may not have a phone or, or whatever the case may be. The things that were a part of their life, a daily life before COVID um, was no longer, and so to see um, them struggle through that, uh, I, it's yeah. I just wish that we had more of the community um, being able to, you know, see what we're doing and the providers to come in to, um, you know, make it a little easier, take some of those barriers away. Um, so I'm just hoping that things get back to somewhat normal. Um, I mean, me, I'm even for just wearing a mask for the, you know, the next three years, just let, let's, let's open up some stuff. Let's open back up some of the services that these individuals need like mental health um, and start, start rebuilding again. We have to start somewhere. I mean, we can't just let COVID, you know, kind of knock us down. Um, we're stronger than COVID, or at least I think so. <laughs> I know for for me, um, <clears throat> when COVID first started, I was still a program manager over at Tacoma Rescue Missions, uh, Tyler Family Campus. And um, one of the things that uh, the residents that I was serving had a problem with was um, that togetherness that wasn't allowed anymore. Like um, I had to, you know, um, kind of um, stop the visitors from coming. Um, and then something that I seen um, when I got over to the tiny homes was, you know, every month at the Tyler Family Housing, we would have a community meeting um, where all of the, you know, the people in the community and the villages get together and, you know, break bread and have camaraderie and, and, and all of that. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've seen that kind of hurt, you know, the fact that we, we, you know, couldn't get together anymore, couldn't sit around. Um, and eat together, couldn't sit around and share stories, couldn't sit around um, because of the six foot thing or, you know, uh, because of COVID, we couldn't just get together. Uh, that's one of the bigger things that I've seen that, you know, the, 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 uh, the villagers, um, you know, we're, we're, we're suffering from, you know, um, couldn't go in nobody's home, um, you couldn't sit under the tent together. So, those community meetings and gatherings, um, that's one of the bigger things that I've seen that hurt um, in reference to the COVID. Yeah, I definitely think that, that you know, you guys both basically said this is true. It is a community. It's, it's not allowing others to come in because uh, we don't want, you know, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the individuals come in and they already have that kind of like they're isolated, right? Like it's uh, their their own, you know, entity because, you know, they keep to themselves, you know, because of uh, a lot of the trauma from, if you know, from experience and homelessness. So it's like, now it's like, because we're considered a congregate shelter, we're not allowed to let individuals in unless they live there or you're part of the referral agency. 
um, into that context way because we had a lot of people who would like to come in and and uh, and like you know uh, paint in the tiny homes, write murals on the tiny homes, help work in the garden, stuff like that. And then it it kept it it kept it away from this us and them stigmatism where it's like either you're on this side of the fence and you live in a shelter or you're on this side of the fence and you're part of the community. And so when it was we did things together, it was it was simpler. Um, you know, there was more of that, that easier transition too. Uh, and I do think that, uh, you know, not allowing visitors because, you know, uh, because we're considered a common shelter, so can't have visitors. I mean, they can't have visitors. Uh, that's a huge one too, because it's like, uh, this is where I live, but you can't come where I live. And that, you know, I think that was a big take back for a lot of individuals that stayed there. Cause I was uh, working with Lehigh when, it, when, when the COVID hit and I seen that we had to take that away from them. Um, and that was huge. It was that was one of the things that kept them happy that the family would come and see them. It reminded them that just because they're in a shelter, maybe they have family that lives in the home. But we still, you know, they came to see them, you know, and, uh, and that was huge. I think that really helped and motivated them and kind of kept them moving forward, you know. And uh, so that that was definitely another big take back from it. And again, also like uh, like Ty had mentioned, you know, that uh, people want to see what it is. Uh, like I had an amazing lady donate some clothing racks, right? And so we had to set up a really nice clothing uh, uh, clothing center at our village. So she'd like to come in and see it. And I told her, I apologize. And I sent her a picture and wrote, you know, but uh, it's it's like, you know, they get to come in and see the village as it progresses and so on. And not like we're, we're putting individuals on display. They come in because we have that open gate. And so they come in, you know, we, we did barbecues, you know, we would hang out, there would be, you know, uh, uh, paint parties, it was like, it was never like a, hey, come in here and check it out how they're living, because that's not what we want to do either. We want to make sure that we respect everybody that, hey, this is where you live, and somebody's just coming into the neighborhood. And so, you know, let's, let's welcome them, you know, they want to have a barbecue, so on and so forth. I've personally brought uh, my, my children to the village, my brothers came by, his wife, you know, so family comes by, it's like, you know, your family comes by, my family comes by, and we speak, you know, really creates that that bond and so I think that's it. that is truly the biggest thing is uh that community sense which is one of the number one things you're working on trying to work especially with somebody who is experiencing homelessness for chronically yes that we all have the need to to be loved to to have a community and we bring that we don't my job that when I go to work it doesn't seem like work um, we go in, we do barbecue, um, we do Christmas. I mean, we, we do everything else like a family would do. And um, they need that. They, that's one of the biggest things that I think that um, individuals who have been unsheltered for so long need a sense of belonging that I do belong here. I can be here. I am loved. I am somebody. And we bring that every day. So, I mean, it's like, when we go to work, it's more like a, I wouldn't say a party, but it's its definitely not work. <laughs> Don't tell the boss that. We're just going to keep that one right here. Is this recording right now? Very good. Even if they heard it, that's how it should be. It should, that's, you know, in the field we're in and what we're doing, it, it should be more of a community atmosphere um, than just a, a job paper pushing paper so on the love that you have for your job extends to how you are with the people that live in that community and just hearing all of you share like you guys express so much love and appreciation for your roles and acknowledgement of you know how people are filling you up and how you guys are supporting them and it's just an incredible to hear I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, it's it's been a wonderful presentation, and we really appreciate your support of our Spring Fair research project. Appreciate the feedback that you gave on our forms, the communication, and um, and just presenting us. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'll get those links to you. Get that all that information to you. And I already wrote down about the the meeting. And I would definitely like to attend that. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, farewell. See you around. See you around. Take care. All right. Bye. bye. God bless. Bye. Take care. Bye.